What's going on? Danny Crew, it's Andrew here, and we are here today for the 2024 USA Nationals gameplay breakdown. Now, we're not going to go through every single little nuance in this interview, but we're going to talk about my journey, getting there, kind of the mindset that I put into becoming successful and getting the USA National title, and then we're going to be going through a lot of key strategic decisions so you can see how does somebody think at the highest level of Catan when it comes to your placements, your tactical and trading decisions, and of course, how do you close out the game to win it all. I think you're gonna really love this. It's with myself and also another Catan legend, David George over here on this side of the screen. I'll include all his socials below. I definitely recommend to follow him. An amazing creator and person. Learn a ton, have a great time. I think you're in for a special treat. But he's here. All right, there we go. The champ, the champ, champ has arrived. Ah, thank you, man, I appreciate it. There we go. It's an amazing feeling, amazing for sure. Yeah, how are you doing today this on this Saturday, Dandy? It's been amazing, man. Um, I posted a video actually yesterday. I wanted to kind of give it a couple days to kind of just let, absorb a, you know, what, what happened there over the weekend. And I re received so many messages, a lot of love, which was amazing. So yeah, I'm super excited for this. I, I love to kind of maybe share some of my thoughts and, and kind of talk about the journey a little bit and you know, see what wisdom and insights we can impart. Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm very excited. I know there's a lot of your journey and your process and your planning that is totally undocumented. So I want to get all of that out into the air today and uh, let the people know what a dandy do. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Also, big, massive kudos to you, dude. I mean, three years and it's so funny. We were kind of discussing this a couple of days ago, the, the full circle of all of this, you know, um, after yeah. your journey as well and how we, we started together and now we're here together. So it's um, I hope we can unpack that a little bit, too. Yeah, well, I mean, that's kind of how I wanted to kick things off by just saying that, uh, yes, obviously, those of you uh, who are here from Dandy side already know who he is, uh, YouTuber, streamer, Catan player extraordinaire, um, the bold mamba, they call him. <laughs> <laughs> Kobe. Um, Kobe, yeah. exactly, inspired uh, by the greats. And uh, it turns out that, yes, exactly three years ago, I was uh, playing Catan for the first time, playing on stream. And this, this guy came into my chat and said, I know a thing or two about Catan. I've been playing for a few months. Uh, and it, in fact, was you. And I, I put that into my first video. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's crazy. I was at that time, I was just floating around Twitch looking for people that were streaming Catan because, you know, there wasn't many of us around at that time and popped into your stream. I liked what you were doing. I liked the attitude you brought. And it's just kind of crazy, you know, the butterfly effect of maybe that one pressing follow all of a sudden you know we we kind of have this amazing relationship you've gone on your journey i've gone on mine so it's it's so weird life works that way sometimes yeah and and a lot of people uh might not know that you know this was long before there was a dandy drew youtube channel and mm -hmm. uh, before before even the dandy crew existed can you imagine a time before that um <laughs> So yeah, it's, wild. yeah it's, it's been a journey. A lot has happened since then. We've obviously, together, we founded events. We've, we've launched CPI, which we've now had four editions of. And it, it, I would say that it's probably the most prestigious event going around. It's crazy. Yeah. 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 It's, been, it's been a pleasure, man. And uh, I, know, I know you're excited to be here, but I'm equally just excited for, for your journey as well. So yeah. Um, so it's, 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 uh, it's poetic to have this all going on today. But um, you know, people want to know, what, what is going on with the Dandy Drew? What, what happened at that event? You know, we got to see a little bit on the, on, the, on the live stream, but we've missed so much, you know? Yeah, and at some point, I will be breaking down as much of that tournament. I mean, I've got all the boards and everything that happened. It was interesting. Um, I got there on Friday. The tournament was on Saturday. And uh, going into the game one, it's funny. I actually lost that game on seven points. And... Um, what was interesting is I met up with Andrew Scott, Big Red Swimmer, and he also lost on seven. So immediately, like, there was kind of like this uh, buddy bond of, okay, man, like, we're in the same spot. Let's see what we can do. Because um, what happens when you play a big tournament like that and you lose your first game, or let's say you have like a seven pointer, pretty much you've only got one or two options. You either win all the rest of your games or you get like win, win, nine. Eight was not enough. So there was only two scenarios kind of like uh, Marvel, you know, Infinity Wars, where there's only one or two scenarios where I get to the playoffs. Um, I end up winning game two, uh, and then I won game three, and I got, like, clutched out nine points on that last game, like, by the skin of my teeth. 
And it was exactly the scenario that pushed me into the top 16, um, which was just kind of wild. You know, it's like I kind of knew what I needed to do at the start of the tournament and it worked out. Yeah, um, very exciting. And obviously we do have a lot of uh, gameplay deep dive planned here. But before we get into that, um, you know, it's it's been a while since you've mm -hmm. been in this Catan journey and uh, a lot's happened. Obviously, you've you've been everywhere. You've won many different things and um, obviously learned and learned from and learned with the best. Um, what what does it mean to you now at this point in your life to have to have won the American National Championship? Such a such an achievement. You know, it's looking back on the journey and, you know, I've traveled to tons of tournaments. I've, I was trying to calculate this the other day. I've played like over 50 tournaments online and thousands of games. Um, kind of with the YouTube presence, like my, my goal over the last year has always been to build a community. So in a sense, like I kind of wanted to win this for the, for the community as a whole. I wanted to win it for the Dandy crew. Obviously it's, it's a great achievement on a personal level. But I also feel a sense of satisfaction, like I've done a lot of great things. I've won more tournaments and events that I've, you know, than I, that I needed. So there's a sense of just kind of like, this is a win for the community. Like, let's keep going. Let's keep building. And I still think even as a whole, like we're, we're not even at 15, 20% capacity of where Catan could be. So that's kind of my eye. It's like, cool, awesome. You know, I get to enjoy the win for myself, but I also get to share it with this amazing group of people as well. And that's, that to me is the best. Love that. Um, yeah, for the for the community, for the Dandy crew, and obviously they're, they're already showing up here to support. We've got plenty of Dandy crew members. Let's go! Let's go. Give us, a, give, it, us a, give us a Dandy crew in the chat if you're, if you're or, or whatever. The, I don't know. Do you, do you get them to say something? Not really. You know, there's a let's go. There's GG. There you go. You know, there you what's go. going on? Yeah. <laughs> what's going on? You got Disney. it. Um, yeah. So you, you have now re returned from, from the tournament, from, from Minnesota, I believe, the Mall of America. Uh, St. Paul, actually. So, oh. I, you know, it's it's funny. I originally, on the, the video I did last week, I was like, I'm going to Minnesota um, or Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. And the whole time I was actually wrong. I'm, I was going to St. Paul, which is the, you know, it's the twin city. So it's the neighboring city. Um, so I told some people I was going to somewhere else. But, uh, okay, the Uber got me exactly where I needed to go. <laughs> it seems that way. Uh, yeah. if, if my eyes serve me well, that camera had you on it. Uh, mm -hmm. So you've returned back to Florida, back home, I believe. Um, how, was, how was the experience outside of the gameplay of it? Obviously, there's so much that you can talk about what it was like to actually play those games, the strategy. You do that yeah. every single day. But as a person, as Drew, what was it like being there? Yeah, well, honestly, the biggest part, I mean, obviously playing the games, that's kind of like where you're in the zone. I mean, the biggest part, and I'd like to think most people probably felt this way, is just meeting the people. Because, uh, you know, for, for us, we've been in the scene for a long time. And, you know, there's all these people that you've played tons and tons of games with, you know, you've talked to in VC or you've, you know, DM'd. And then to be able to get there and, and meet people, some people were uh, returning, right? So like Sonny, I met last year and, and got to know him a little bit, obviously, Got to know him a lot more this this year, which was amazing. And some people were completely new, like uh, Papa Sturdy I met for the first time, uh, Byron Logic I met for the first time. So it's the people, man. That, I mean, that's that's what makes it, I think, really interesting and fun. Um, I didn't really sleep that well most of the nights. I, I think my my room, like the AC was broken. So most nights, like, I struggle to sleep. But we, when you get onto the floor, it's more of almost like you're just – mission energy you know it's like almost like an adrenaline rush until you get to the end so wish i slept a little bit better but it is what it is i mean you can't have regrets after winning the damn <laughs> thing <laughs> oh of course of course i yeah. felt overall i felt amazing through the whole thing and and just again the the energy with from everybody and the positivity and the encouragement um i mean that's the biggest win in my book love it um and yes obviously chat is gonna want Lots of attention this stream. Um, we're going to try and keep things on track to keep this interview jam-packed and, and concise. Of course. Yeah. But, uh, but yes, chat, we do see you. We appreciate you. And uh, and Dandy Drew loves the Dandy crew. He knows you're there. It's all good. I see you. I see you there guys. You go. Um, all right. So, so what we saw the most of, actually, from your whole experience there was the final. But the games leading up to that were mm -hmm. completely undocumented. I don't know if any of them were actually recorded. Um, so I would love to hear what how, how that went down. I know you talked a little bit about the points, but 
were there any moments where you were matched up against people that you knew or any specifically strong players um, that made you maybe have to rethink your game plan? No, I, I mean, with the exception of one table, I only ran into one other person from the Discord. There were some people that knew me, um, but maybe like psychologically not knowing them might have kind of also kind of, I just, you know, I just stayed focused and played my game. Like I said, game one, I got seven points. Um, I did get the nine at one point, then someone sniped road away from me and took the win. Uh, game two was actually my best game. And actually, looking back at it, that game was the reason I got into the playoffs because my essentially I was at 36 points. And there was a group of people that were teetering between, you know, essentially getting the playoffs and not at 36. But I ended up winning that game 10-5-5-5. Five, five, five. So it gave me such a, a huge VP percentage advantage that, um, you know, I felt pretty comfortable as long as I'm in the 36 group that I was probably going to make playoffs. Uh, game three was pretty solid. Somebody did a goon setup, which I was absolutely, <laughs> I couldn't believe that. Wow. They gooned on like, yeah, yeah. They gooned on a six wood three one port and then try to drop two roads to build to a three hex. I'm like, why don't you just start with the three hex? But okay. Um, that was actually just, I had a great setup. I pulled an early road builder that got me onto, uh, the six or, and at that point I was just cooking devs and dropping cities. And then game four was the most interesting one because it was like do or die with that situation. I either get nine points or win. And it was funny because most of the people at the table were like, well, we can't make playoffs, but you can. And they were very encouraging at the start saying like, oh, we're going to help you out. I mean, they were never going to like feed me the win. But it's really funny. Like once the game got moving, uh, the energy shifted really quick and they got super competitive. And I barely made nine points. Like one orbit earlier, if the other guy won, I would have been probably like 17th or 18th place. So it's a game of margins, man. It's it's a tough tournament. Like every little decision really matters. And um it's it's hard uh it's hard to understate that. Yeah, and that's something that I think will will be emphasized a little bit as we get into the into the the meat of the of that final. Um mm -hmm. but yeah, very interesting to hear how how varied those experiences were across the different qualifiers. I mean, getting gooned on is pretty is pretty <laughs> wild and uh it does not happen often in Catan. Um, yeah, you know it's it's funny about that is like when when he placed on it. Now, he was a really nice guy, by the way. Um but there was this like moment we all everyone else at the table all looked at each other and like you know the the glancing eyes like did that just happen? We didn't say anything, you know, because we want to respect him and, you know, have him do his game. But it was just interesting to see in the dynamic. Like, everyone's like, wow. It was a silent wow, wow though. Yeah. Um, that's pre that is pretty funny to see happen. But, yeah, I, I'm, it, it's, it's cool to hear that actually, even in, even though in the fourth game, a lot of people knew that they might not have chances to qualify or maybe none of them, um, mm -hmm. they still gave it a good old a good old sporting go and, um, and really did their best. So... Uh, yeah, they made it. They made it a challenge, and you you barely scraped through. Then it, it sounds like you really by a matter of one point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if it was one orbit earlier that the player won, I would not have made playoffs. So wow. it's it's a game of one percent, really, when you're playing at the highest level. Which yeah. I, you know, for me, I've always said that. You know, it's like you should take every orbit, every hand, every turn. You know, you should play it to the best of your ability because you never know what that could entail. You know, if you don't. Yeah, and uh, at the end of the day, making playoffs is all, is all you need to do. I, it's not a huge That's difference it. between being last and first. And um, it's funny because actually both of us within the last few months have won fairly large tournaments as quite low seeds. Uh, I think I went into CPI, I was like 15th mm -hmm. out of the top 16, and you were, I think, 13th or 14th here? 14th, um, yeah. 14th. So, uh, you know, once, you, once you've got the chance, it's all you need. It, it's, it's better access to, the, to winning the thing uh, than anyone else, obviously outside of the top 16 anyway. So you just got to make it in there. Yeah, I think that's the mindset. Everyone's just top 16, go to bed, like tomorrow's a new day. And um, yeah, I did it. It's, uh, that, that was a good night. That was a good night. And again, like I have to give a lot of credit to the Big Red Swimmer. Like him and I were really buddy-buddy that whole time. Like we were checking in in between games and encouraging each other. And then I went out with him uh, the night before the playoffs and we had a really nice walk and talk. And um, it was really nice. I, I felt like him and I kind of leveled up our relationship as friends. So. Yeah, no, I, I know that uh, I think uh, Andrew mentioned it a bit of that in his commentary that one, one of the Andrews, one of the Drews is going to have to bring it home. And, <laughs> that was it, uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, before we get into the playoffs, it's, okay. uh, it was quite a tournament for the Dandy crew as a whole, actually. 
there were quite a few of you and last year I, I would say it was it was not that many at all and this year I feel like popping up everywhere there was about 10 different people I think who qualified to our dandy crew members which was really cool how, how was that for you that was amazing that was amazing um obviously for those who don't know I do run a coaching program called TSI and uh, we sent about eight or nine of us within TSI which was amazing to me you know some of these people that you know I've been trying to coach and level up and then I did get a lot of people that came up to me. I did some photos. Uh, you know, it's it's such a small pond that it it is, you know, a nice little moment. But at the same time, like, uh, you know, we're all on that journey. So that was just really cool to see. Um, some people have been watching and it's it's been helping them. Which, again, like going back to my motivation at this point, it's it's really been about like trying to raise the tide for as many boats as I can. So, yeah, that was that was amazing. That was like the just cherry on top of everything. Yeah, and I, I was excited to see that uh, almost all of them ended up picking a win at, uh, picking up a win at some point. I think, uh, yeah, Pizza mm -hmm. Penguin got one, Arop got one. Arop was really close, uh, Alan. I, I believe he, I think he actually got two wins. Yeah, yeah. Uh, pizza, yeah. Pizza was really, yeah, really close. Alan, um, a Rop was really close. Gigs pulled a pretty clutch win. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I, th I think almost all of them did. Yeah. Oh, and he's actually here in chat, 23rd overall. Yeah, I mean, it was really, I think that was a matter of literally like one or two points. That was the difference. Uh, super close. What I'm saying, one point can make the difference. It's 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 really a weird thing to think about, you know, after you leave the whole experience. It's like, you know, and then you start thinking about which trades maybe could I have done differently? Maybe could I have optimized my hand? You know, could I have been a little bit more patient with this or that? Um, which is good. Like, that's the way you should think about Catan. It's, it is a game of 1% so if you want to get to the top. Yeah, definitely. And uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very excited because I've done a fair bit of preparation to get into this final, but uh, the semi-final was also not streamed. And uh, <laughs> I believe, I believe in fact, that you, you, you didn't want the game to be streamed. I think, maybe, uh, I, I was curious about that. I heard that you had potentially, you had asked for the game to not be covered. Who said that? I don't know. I think there was uh, someone at the event was sharing that... Um, that you didn't want the game to be streamed, that uh, maybe it would have influenced some of your game decisions. I, I actually have no idea about that. Um, no, I guess no that's, that's not that's not true at all. Okay. Um, I had no I had no opinions about it. I didn't say anything. Oh, um, and I also there was a lot of us that felt they were probably going to do the Amanda game just because it did have the first seed. It had Amanda who was returning. But yeah, no, I mean, trust me, I would have loved to have my game streamed the way it played out. <laughs> so. Yeah. Ah, sorry, Shay just saying that this happened in the preliminary rounds. Um... Oh, I uh, well, I didn't record my games. Like, I didn't want to record my games. Not not because, like, I mean, it, was, it actually would have been a lot of fun. But also just I wanted to take the pressure off. Like, I didn't want to put the camera there. I just wanted to kind of focus on the game, have a good time. I didn't want them to feel the pressure of being recorded and potentially going to YouTube. So that that's probably what they're referring to. But no, if they yeah. stream my semis, I would have been ecstatic. Yeah, so I'm I'm curious about that because it, it was not streamed. Uh, none, I think you were the only table. You you were the only hope for the online scene uh, on your table. Every other table had multiple people who had competed mm -hmm. online before, and you you were the only one. Um, so when you were lined up against those those three other players, did you know them already? How did you feel going into that semi table? So the only player that I knew from last year was Nabil, and um, I knew he was a really strong player. He's kind of one of those in-person players that has a really good reputation. His, he's got solid talk. Uh, Luke, who did really well. I got to meet him actually on the, the qualifying day. He came up to me and we spoke briefly. So kind of interesting that we got paired up there in the semis. Then Riley was kind of the wild card uh, because this was her first ever nationals. Apparently she won an event, you know, first regional, won it, comes to nationals, get the semis, which is like a huge accomplishment in itself. And um, I, I was told, like, she was super sharp. You know, she kind of was a quick-witted as well. And that was true. <laughs> like, she was really good. So I didn't have a lot of information, but I knew it was a good table. Yeah. And uh, I believe we, we got one update on that because I was obviously watching uh, Joshua's game and Tyler. And uh, at some point, someone uh, gave us the update that uh, Drew's tables pause for a bathroom break, uh, bathroom break, and he's walked past him, giving everyone the thumbs up, which means that something good <laughs> is happening. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, we'll we'll get into like what what happened in terms of my, you know, the way the development cards played out. That was just more just good vibes. Like I think that was a big thing for me. I mean, I definitely wasn't winning at that point when I thumbs up, but I I think it was more just kind of keeping my mental state where it needed to be to say like, hey, 
first of all, it's a win that I'm even in the semis. Never mind, you know, like, you know, I'm doing decent. But um, I really try to keep the positivity and keep the energy up. So it was simply just trying to pass good vibes around kind of thing, you know? Yeah, it was given it was the, literally the only piece of information we had on your table. We just had to <laughs> say, probably Danny's yeah, yeah. winning. And then actually it did happen. Um, yeah. So maybe maybe you could talk a little bit about how that how that went down um some people may know how crazy the semi-final game was and uh yeah i mean what what, what was it like for you playing through that game it sounds like it must have been a, a pretty surreal game it's it's funny it wasn't that crazy um because so if you look at the position i don't know if you have it up or not but i essentially end up taking more or less a development card game um Personally, I felt like it was one of the weaker ones, but it was also a little bit more of a sneakier setup. And once I, I kind of foregoed the early city, which is usually against my rules, and I, I ended up popping early three devs. Um, not it was essentially like a dev each turn, right? So the first three orbits, I popped a dev, and it was VP, VP, VP. And what was interesting was cities were starting to drop. So like even though I had down devs, um, the board was bouncing in its own way with everyone kind of doing something. And they started to say, like, well, he's got three down devs. Maybe we should block him. So I was like, oh, God, like, if I get blocked or I get soloed here, I'm in trouble because they're going to know, like, I'm not flipping a knight. So one orbit, one more orbit goes by. I buy dev. It's a knight, which is perfect because the next orbit, they do solo block me. And I'm like, guys, don't worry. I, like, I, you know, I can play my knights. I need to fight Nabil. He's got a much stronger setup. So, like, in a way, the timing of that was perfect where I could kind of conceal my VPs and have them think maybe I have more knights. And I'm fighting against the stronger OWS player. So that was kind of like the early game vibe for me. Uh, and where it got interesting was Nabil did end up taking army and they started to realize like, oh, this Drew doesn't have knights. Like he's not playing anything. Um, so I just slowly tried to pop another VP. Um, and then a road battle ensued. So Riley and Luke were getting to this really big rat road battle. Luke was dropping cities and he had these monster rolls. So that gave me actually a ton of space and time to work to say like, we need to fix this road battle. And, you know, like, you know, it's very classic Catan, right? Like, we're all kind of shifting resources to make sure somebody doesn't go to eight or nine points. And then I get catch a really, a couple good rolls. I city and I pull another VP. And it's like, you know, all of a sudden I have the win with five VPs, two cities, and a settle. So that's the short of it. But, like, the way the game actually played out was just really strange. Like, it wasn't a big firework game. But when you pull five VPs, it's about as max efficiency as you can get. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to ask, can you remember the last time that you pulled five VPs in a game? Yes. Yeah. Um, it's on YouTube. It's on YouTube against another Discord player in a ranked game. And I had the worst setup ever, and I'm just pulling to save my life, and I pulled five there. I've pulled it maybe two. That would have been my third time, I think, pulling five VPs. It's, uh, and that's it's over like eight or 9,000 games, <laughs> you know? So it's so rare. It's so rare. It yeah, was wild. Yeah, all the games to... To, to really get all of the extra victory points for the cheapest possible price that it is a, not a bad game to, to pull that out. Yeah. Yeah. And what was interesting was I had a big turn. So that, that final turn where I city and pulled the VP, you know, I'm sitting there four down devs, um, drop the city, pull the VP. And then it's just like, I slowly turned each one over <laughs> and they're just staring at me. Like there was no words that were exchanged for about like 10 seconds. Cause it's like, what do you, what do you, how do you process that? just like totally surreal yeah it's like we all just kind of like shook our heads like i don't know it, it is what it is <laughs> so that's very funny yeah and i believe we were the first game done so that was like a nice little i got a little extra time to take a breather and get ready for the finals yeah so speaking of which maybe we start uh building up to that i'll uh let's I'll do share it my screen with you so um there we go okay so you mentioned that you were actually the first, uh, you were the first to finish. And mm -hmm. that's interesting because I suppose that you would have then one by one learned who your fellow finalists were. Is that how it worked? Yeah, I mean, I wasn't so glued into who was winning, who wasn't. I mean, at that point, I just wanted to go downstairs, take a moment, you know, drink some water. But yeah, I mean, slowly I started to hear, you know, Josh won his game, Sonny won his game, Zhao won his game, so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Crazy and, table too. And, yeah. Well, exactly. And coming up against uh, Shao, Shazzy, and uh, Joshua, who you're familiar with, Sonny, who you said mm -hmm. you played with before. What did that? What did that feel like? Uh, you know, there's so many 
characters coming at you. Uh, I suppose you're used to used to taking on the best, but how did it how did it feel seeing that lineup and, and knowing what it, what was going to be ahead of you? It's funny. As far as I know, I mean, I've known Shazzy, I've known Josh for a couple of years. I don't think we've ever played any games together. And then Sonia, like I said, I just met last year. So as far as I knew, this was the first time playing any of them. Now, of course, like I've seen Shazzy play, incredible player. I mean, definitely a top 10 player in the world. Um, I've had a lot of respect for Josh's game and what he's been able to do over the last year and change. And then I knew Sonny was a strong player. I mean, he's he's shown consistency every time he comes to these tournaments. So my biggest thing with them was just to say, like, let's have a good game. Because no one wants to get to the final table and have it be a blowout or, you know, somebody's just dying and, and can't kind of figure it out. So I kind of emphasized that early on. I was like, hey, guys, let's 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 really bring something special to the community. Let's have a great game. Let's keep the communication strong. And um, I don't know how much of that priming actually made a difference. But in my mind, I felt like I set the right intention with that board and kind of what I wanted to see out of it. Cool. Yeah, it sounds like uh, that was that was pretty important to you. And I, I know that even before going to nationals, you mentioned that you had you had a certain way you wanted to look at uh, kind of interacting with players and how you wanted to put yourself forward as a player. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it sounds like you tried to set a bit of a, a social basis there and, and try and get everyone in the right headspace, which is uh, which is pretty cool. Yeah, Shades, yeah. Is, Shades is confirming what you said. He was there. <laughs> I said it. I said it yeah, for sure. It. I think that's, the, you know, before we dive into this, I mean, that was, for those who have known me for a while, like I have always been a talkative player and maybe more on the aggressive side over the last couple of years. But, um, you know, a lot of things have changed you know, kind of with the integration of the channel and trying to shift my priorities, and especially with this tournament where, like I said in the video, you have to sit across somebody, you have to look them in the eyes, you have to kind of manage everyone's emotional state. I wanted to really bring as many good vibes as I can. I didn't want to bring any kind of aggression. And, um, you know, I think it worked. I think it worked out pretty well. But um, I definitely made some adjustments that I felt needed to be done if I wanted to be successful here. So... It's tough. It's tough. I mean, this is part of the journey, right? Like to be able to to look in the mirror and say, like, where do I need to improve if I want to keep moving forward in this space? Yeah, one hundred percent. And it's uh, it sounds like you you uh, you really took the most out of a bit of a bit of time off, a bit of a break, and and came back with a really healthy mindset to uh, to take these guys down in a, in the biggest game of your life. <laughs> yeah, I mean. It was as close as it can be, though, to be fair, right? I mean, everyone played amazingly, and I'm really excited because I think we can kind of offer in, uh, some really cool insights as far as long-term strategy. And But yeah, it was an amazing game. I mean, I think everyone played. I think we brought something really special to the community with this game, and like for that reason, we're all winners in that sense. Yeah, I think uh, it is definitely a good thing for the game of Catan that so many people could not believe that you could win with that setup. I think there is, uh, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot, yeah. to, there's a lot, for, there's a lot to learn. Clearly. Um, it is not just a game of dice luck. And I, I think you, uh, you did a good job of showing how a solid game plan can really change the way that the game is played. Um, but I don't want to spoil too much. Uh, nope, nope, we'll nope, have to nope. get into Let's, that. We'll, we'll dive. We'll deep dive. Yeah. Right. It's, um, you know, I, as I like to say with most things in life, when you get to a, the higher levels, it's there's levels to it. And um, sometimes if you're at a certain level, you it's hard to see what's above that, right? Because you're stuck in the way you think and some of your biases and the strategies you have. So that's that's my goal, at least unpacking a lot of these decisions to show you maybe different ways to look at the game so that you can start to implement it in what you do as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, so in your first... In this in this game, you ended up in first position. You obviously did not have a choice in the matter. Um, in both games, yeah. Right. So discovering that you were actually first on this board, how how much time did you have uh, to to kind of to absorb that and to look at the board itself? It was hard to say, just because you know there was a period where we were kind of sitting there looking at the board and discussing positioning, and then at some point we don't I don't think we quite know like we were live, <laughs> so. I think it kind of happened somewhere in the middle of our analysis. But I'd say probably we had, I mean, Josh can back me up. Maybe I just lost track of time. It felt like at least 10, 15 minutes from the time we sat down at the board to the time we decided to start placing. Which, yeah, interesting. Which, you know, I, I felt good about that. I, I think um, 
think 10 to 15 minutes to be able to kind of really break it down. I mean, I felt comfortable with it. You know, like I've played so many games at this point that almost part of it was an intuitive response to what I wanted to do as well. So, mm. yeah. And discovering that you were first, uh, you know, you're looking at this board here. How, how do you feel about being first, you know? I didn't particularly like it. And I was actually shocked, um, but maybe not because first is kind of a little wonky. But to go from fourth to first, I wonder how many times that's actually happened in a finals, a national finals. Probably not too often, but yeah, I was like, okay, it's not a bad board. There's a lot going on here. Like we'll all have a game, which ultimately I was like, I'm cool with that. Yeah, and uh, and we do actually see. Mm -hmm. uh, so your your first pick on this board was, I mean, the uh, many adjectives could could be used to describe how people felt about this controversial, blasphemous, impossible, unplayable. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No matter how they slice it. <laughs> no matter how you slice it, you couldn't win this game. And I'm here to tell you, you just walking up for a dream. You did not win the finals. Um, damn. Damn. Uh, pretty brutal. Sorry to break it, but eight four five. You know, having watched you develop as a player and, and seeing you perform in tournaments and and watching uh, you know your content, you you like taking strong wheat and even the double wheat meta is something I've seen you talk about before. Uh, yeah. A wheat port strategy is definitely something that's not foreign to you or, or games that you've played. In fact, that's how you. Uh, that's how you made it into the uh, the playoffs of CPI in the last event that we did was with a fantastic wheat port setup. Um, so yeah. I, I'm wondering how much of that was going through your head when you were looking at the eight four five. What what did you want to happen in this situation when when you're in first? So here here's my here's the strategic edge that I think I, I had with this pick. I was thinking about obviously you when you look at a board you want to pick spots that that are cohesive, that work together, right? Maybe your ore wheat sheep or your wood and your brick. But the first thing I thought about was like, this is a great table. It's going to get balanced no matter what, right? That That's kind of like the higher level piece of this is the game will balance out. So if you're thinking, if that's your starting position to say, okay, it's a balanced game, what do I need to do to give me an imbalance? So now you need to start thinking about yourself as a player. You need to start thinking about what skills you have that maybe the other players they might have it, but maybe not as sharp as you do. And to me, looking at uh, the three players, I was like, well, I think I'm a, I think I'm the better trader and dealmaker, period. So that was the imbalance that I thought was going to give me an edge here, right? I could take the 6104, I can play Orwee Cheap, I can buy devs, but that's only one piece of the puzzle. So with the 854, I was like, okay, they're probably going to lock the wheat situation. The wheat port is always an out. I can always just take that and play that trade my life away, which is, you know, we'll see here soon what happens. And I also thought maybe potentially the 810 to 84 could have been a play as well. That would have been the best case, right? If I can get the starting road, take go to the wheat port. And then if the board doesn't get locked on the ore side, it can always take something like the 6311. But I figured it would. So I don't know. I, I think it's one of those things where once my mind was set on it, I didn't fight it too much. It was more just like an intuitive response. I just really liked the 854 because I felt that's where my advantage was to be able to trade. Yeah, so it, and it comes uh, down to that essentially. Yeah, exactly. And and actually, what you what you mention, go to the. Yep. So so actually, in this moment, and I'm going to play this for the stream, and I hope you can hear this too. Um, this is a moment where before you put down the placement, you do attempt to uh, figure something out with Shazzy with Shao, um, mm. and I'll, I'll play that clip here real quick. This is not how I But now the eight four is effectively so, a dead spot, right? Chaz. Yes. I can lead the eight four. Where else are you going? I'll be like nine four eleven down. Okay. So what what happened there is you said to Shazzy that you would consider leading the eight four. Um, yep. Yep. And and potentially taking nine four eleven down. Um, and uh, I believe that ended up basically coming down to whether he would offer you a brick, uh, a brick trade. So yeah, that's my first question. Is this something that you would have seriously considered? Is this something that you would have ever sacrificed the wheat port for? Do you think it was enough value or are you just playing with your options? I'm playing with my options here. Uh, I think my heart was always set on the wheat port. Also like from a framing perspective, I kind of wanted it to come off slightly defensive, which it is like uh, on some level. But I think if I can frame it as like, hey, I'm I'm limiting Shazzy's options so that he's not as strong, all of a sudden it kind of puts me in a position where it's like I'm trying to do it for the table, 
which I was on some level, but I wanted to emphasize that more than saying I have actually like a semi-aggressive fighting setup. So it's there's a lot of framing that happens during this game in terms of like how I'm positioned against the table, how I can work with them. So that was ultimately my goal was just to kind of paint doing this so that Shazzy doesn't get too strong too fast. Yeah, and I believe actually uh, the sentence you used when you placed on that weak ball was "Let's have fun." Um, <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, yeah. And I meant it. I think uh, I really did. I wanted to to have these games be fun and energetic. And um, just so happens I was given kind of like the weirdest, wackiest setup to the wacky Wii port, right? Uh, for this finals. Yeah. Um, and and that that it was. I'm sorry that actually you can't hear the clips, but I'll, I'll try and I'll try and uh, fill you in. Most of them are most of them are pretty yeah. self-explanatory. I, I remember I remember most of these turns anyway. So yeah. I mean, does the audience hear it? Yeah, audience can hear it. It's, it's all good on my side. Cool. That's all that matters. Yes. I know. I know what happened. Yeah, you were there. That's true. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, <clears throat> so you've gone through uh, some of the benefits of uh, of of what you think the eight four five can offer you on this board. Lots of wheat. Um, there was something else that I actually wanted to to bring up, which is the feast or famine aspect of the setup. Yeah, I didn't really think about it much, to be honest with you. Like, they weren't bad numbers. I didn't have a lot of numbers. I had literally five hexes and three numbers. But um, again, this was just more of a case where I had to take a risk. I had to hopefully get some rolls. But I knew if I had weed or I had cards, I could trade it. I could flip it for value. So from that standpoint, that's like the compensation, right? Like, okay, I might not have as many rolls as you guys, but if I'm getting two for ones or I'm getting non-block deals with those cards, to me, that that's probably just enough compensation to keep me in the game. And I was happy with that fact. Yeah, and and there is kind of just uh, just to give some hopefully a little nugget to those uh, in in the audience who may not uh, have have worked out all of the kinks with Feast or Famine. It's a very it's a very different difficult setup to kind of work out how to play optimally because you don't know when things are going to come through and um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of inherent risks. I think that it's something we talked about on the stream myself and Bo is uh, a Feast or Famine setup will typically um, have the risk of, of overloading your hand. You know, sometimes you don't hit your rolls, but if you do, and they're all coming back to back and you make four cards, five cards on every roll, um, there's a potential to seven out or to get monoed. Uh, but on the flip side, you know, getting a non-block is huge because you only need a couple of rolls to be open. Yeah, I actually had a couple times the eight and four rolled in tandem. And those were like, those were always at least a point, point and a half plays for me. So yeah, it's not ideal. I completely understand, but I also think that perception worked in my favor as far as, well, Drew's got kind of a wonky, I think a lot of people felt like I probably didn't have the strongest setup by any means. So I like that fact. Like it's very, it's not very often I get to play under the radar, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, so, no, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and, it, and it worked out well for you because there, there were some really critical moments where you did, you did a range that you would not be blocked and, and that that's, that's huge, obviously, when you only have a couple of really crucial hexes. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, and what's interesting, Dav, is if you look at the comparative roles, I underrolled. Like, sixes rolled more than the eights significantly. Uh, the nines outrolled the fives, and the tens outrolled the four. <laughs> so, obviously, we'll get into like how I got to the finish line, but it's a very interesting kind of looking at the dice stats as well to see that. Yeah, uh, definitely. So, so, you get into the main game here, and uh... I have a couple of points highlighted. I think this is about to be the first trade. I think this is a one for one with uh, with Sunny, or sorry, with uh, with Shao. Actually, it should be uh, it should yep. be the first trade towards your city. I'll just uh, play this here. <clears throat> now I have a decision to make. I think uh, got production. I got port, but I don't think I'm gonna have the production to use the port. Good. Oh, sorry. This was actually meant to be the uh, the first the first view of the board. Uh, mm. Yep, yep. I think I've actually actually missed it. So I think uh, I may have I may have misplaced the turn. You get a trade with Shal, uh, but that was a, a bit of a no brainer for both of you involved. I think the second uh, there is a trade that you get through yeah, here. This is my only value card right now. Yep. Three, I tell him this is my only value card, and he's yep. got like a handful of cards, and I literally have like three or four cards in hand. Yeah. 
Plus yeah. the six is just a good block anyway. Drew so this is this was, I think, the start, the start of the finish, essentially. Which was yeah. um my goal, like whenever you're playing these these heavy port setups, is to always drop the early city. So I'm snagging ore as quickly as I can to get that eight five four cooking. Yep. And uh and we see there is actually there's actually gonna be the third trade here. Um the reason why I got confused about the order of the trades is because you did actually trade twice with Shades with Joshua um, in the same orbit that you got the city. Um, so you, you ended up flipping a wood for a brick with him. Mm. And, yep. and then on your turn, uh, and we're, we're about to play this here, on, the, on your turn you do actually end up flipping that brick and a sheep back yep. to Joshua for an ore, which is the perfect city. Um, and, and a really interesting part of how you played this game was you actually managed to get the first city down without using the wheat port. Yeah, I I wanted to keep the wheat port as a backup option, which sounds kind of funky, because again, like the whole thing was that I needed to be flipping this wheat for value. I need to be getting two cards, I need to be getting a rare resource and a non-block. So looking back, I think I only used the wheat port two or three times, which is kind of hard to believe. But again, like my the plan of making these trades and using that weed effectively worked out well. Yeah. So I'll just play this but, um, clip here. If you get in yeah, the city. It, yeah. So real quick, it's worth noting, like yeah. tacking on that extra value is critical. So when I traded Sunny that or just to say like, and by the way, like, can you just block the six? Like, just give me a non-block, right? Cause the six is a good block anyways. I don't feel like people push enough, especially when you are in tough positions, you need to be looking for extra value. Like that is an inherent part of playing a high level Catan game. Like you got to kind of squeeze water from a stone. Um, so the fact that I kind of got that early deal with him was actually really nice from the standpoint of like, okay, he's willing to make these deals. Maybe I can get some momentum on these trades. Mm -hmm. And and definitely works. I mean, this, this kind of does appeal to his uh, best interest anyway. I mean, the six is such a good block for him when he has that 10 doubled up. And um, it's just a matter of, yeah, of, of, of securing in that position where he's not really looking to solo block you, making sure that he doesn't do it after you drop the city, which is obviously the game plan. Right, right. And also, like, I pitched, I, I framed it a bit to say, like, well, isn't also wheat good on the board for you guys? So, like, in a way, it's like you you want me to build up so that I can also keep you in the game and feed you guys your cities and your devs that you need, which is pretty much what happened. Yeah, so I'll play this clip out here, and this, this shows how you get yep, your first city it. without ever using the board. Well, he's not blocking me. I'm only doing this because he's... I think he's I'm not blocking you. I said I'm he's, blocking he's, I am building, very much he's building a city. No, no, no you're I'm building a city right. anyway, so I'm like, give him Wouldn't a city. Wouldn't you do the one then? No, because I'm it's a to... city for a settlement. I, I would need the second card. Okay. And Drew does I'm get sorry, a trade I'm down to get that huge the city on that 854. Don't, don't apologize. Yep. No, I'm not making it. That will really accelerate his game. Yep. And uh, commentary kind of saying there, uh, and that's Andrew who is now in the chat actually on commentary, saying, yeah, that, that city's gonna really accelerate your game. The big 854 city, first city of the game. Um, pretty pretty big step forward, considering also you started without any ore. Uh, how did that feel? And at this point, I wasn't, I still knew my setup had a lot of work to do, but it was a win for sure. Uh, I think without that city, like if they're dropping cities and then I'm following behind with my city, then I'm probably behind. But getting that first city is critical. And it's it's a weird balancing act because I'm probably going to get some heat, but then like build the board back up, right? And then build more space. So that's like how you do these setups is you just have to keep balancing it so that you're building space for your roles. Because if you're ever solo blocked, you only have three numbers, right? So if you're solo blocked, you're losing a third of your production, essentially. Yeah, that is the nature of your setup is... Uh... Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very interesting. You did you did end up uh, getting that clean city with with pure trades and giving people everything that they wanted. Um, and yeah, you get that city, and obviously you don't want to get too into how the game does develop. But you, the game plan that you're describing, uh, you know, we do see that come to pass, and uh, you do you do get get hit quite a lot. And and then naturally, the other setups will start to get back into the game, and and you get opened up again to breathe, which is uh, yeah, exactly, yeah, indeed. Awesome. Uh, yeah. So, so moving on, uh, this is actually, this is a 20 minute skip into the future. Um, this takes us to the turn where you have quite the interesting trade, uh, uh, available to you here from Sonny Spencer. He's, he's initially offering, uh, I think mm -hmm. a one for one 
uh, and then a two for two. Uh, there was some discussion around how this trade could possibly make sense. And you don't seem to really want it. And then he throws out four for two. And yeah. I think even at that point, you initially say no. And then he offers it again. And you say, well, what are the four cards? You know, that, that yeah. must have been quite interesting. What was what, what did he think was happening at that point? What, what was the idea? In terms of how it got from, you know, one to one to two to one to four to one or four to yeah, two? Yeah, so, so knowing that that trade is going to, I think he, he even said that it would give him two devs. Um, yeah. What, what do you see in that trade for yourself? I think that that was one of the moments where people were quite divided about uh, whether you needed it. Uh, um, yeah, that's what yeah, I was. I was kind of shocked about that because ultimately, well, I took the trade for a reason, right? Because I thought it was a good trade. This is part of the balancing of it, right? Like what I need Sonny to do is pull knights. Like I'm already playing into the variance of the game. Like people have to understand this is a variance-based setup and I have to take some risk. So for me, feeding him devs, if it was a city, I probably wouldn't do it. But if it's devs in this situation, I'm okay. And I made it, I like I made a comment saying, like, and you're not gonna block me with these, right? So kind of just putting that non-block expectation in there. But the idea is like I want to feed him up so that he gets dangerous. And then he's blocking the six that so the other players aren't building up either, right? Um, so it was just it was a bouncing move, and I felt like the two wood sheep ore is good. And funny enough, that ore, I don't know, I don't recall if I bought a dev with it, but there was some some trades where I ended up getting another city because I got that ore in hand. So yeah, I just felt like I turned one roll into four cards. I was happy with that. Yeah, and I think that's that that's probably the the most interesting way to look at how that trade actually what what that actually is because a lot of people are saying well the two weed probably in a void Sonny gets a little bit more out of the trade just because he gets two pops and you get like an ore and you have some wood but uh, actually you can't buy weed so easily and yeah. sheep and ore are not common at all for you um, and again then the aspect of oh actually it is again this is part of your game plan here which is to not be the winning the entire game the whole time um so to kind of to, to level the playing field a little bit and, it, and then it does seem like a bit more of a balanced trade for you i think when you consider that so what do you like let's ask the audience like what do you turn my weed into generally like what That's am i generally question. porting for Yeah, it's, it's, well, it's very interesting seeing people play with uh, two for one ports. You'll, you'll see them sometimes. Um, they'll port to get a road or they'll port yeah. to buy a dev. And it actually, it was really refreshing seeing you not do that because every time I watch uh, newer players take on a two for one port, they're going to port so aggressively because they can. Um, yeah. But actually, I think what you're showing here is a bit of a masterclass of that, which is you need to get your production to match so that when you're, when you're when you're cutting it through the port every single time, uh, you're still getting some enough out the other side that it would even be worth having the port in the first place. Correct, correct. And just to kind of kind of go back to the question, like generally I'm porting for ore in this setup. So the fact that I turn two wheat into an ore, sheep, and two wood, which by the way, having more cards as a player that trades a lot is also like those two wood could be a deal with Shazzy where he uses his wood port, right? So to me, cards are options. Um, and opportunities. So to me, that was a great trade. I know some people didn't like it because they felt the wood was dead. It's like, again, because I'm opportunistic enough, the cards are really never dead because I can try to find an avenue to either trade them or port them as well. Like to me, once I get the three one port, those two wood are essentially 66% of a card of my choice. So I was kind of shocked that people really didn't like that. But also like feeding him four down devs, I understand is there's an inherent risk with that, right? If he's pulling all the good devs. So let's yeah. see if he does. Well, like you say, you uh, you, you you go into some risk here. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So something I also wanted to check in at this point, you have now you've now given Sonny a couple of devs. You've got a decent trade out of it. Um, Shao has settled and City just got two ports running. Uh, Shades or, or Joshua has is actually on five points. He's the only person on five solid points. He's got a City down. He's got three settles. He's got two ports. What, what is your threat assessment at this point? I mean, do you, I don't know if that was something that you actively were thinking about then, but yeah, what, what is it, you know, here? It's tough. I thought Josh did really well. Like he built up pretty quickly and, and the threes, the threes were rolling great early on, right? So that definitely gave Shao and, and Josh a lot of ability to kind of start dropping roads and building up quickly. I knew the only way I was going to win this game was in the development card deck, essentially. Because like one path is if I can pull a good a bunch of utility devs, that's great. 
But um, now that the board's building up, I felt pretty good about it because now there's more cars, more trade options, right? So I wasn't thrilled that I'm on three points right now, but I also knew that we could probably balance this enough to, to keep me in the game and hopefully get some development cards to keep me moving. So yeah, I wasn't thrilled, but at the same time, like, what are you going to do? You're not going to give up. You're on a, the, the biggest final of your life. So it's just, you just keep going. I, I think that's the, the mindset there. It's a good thing you didn't give up, Drew. <laughs> Probably never be talking right now. <laughs> never, never, yeah. ever, buddy. Yeah. There you go. Um, so we're going to skip forward about another 15 cool. minutes. This is going to take us to, I think, one of my personal favorite moments of this game, which is, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Which is the, the Drew, Sunny, Zhao threesome trade that went in every direction and became uh, really quite convoluted um, between uh, Sunny actually trying to secure a spot with Zhao and at some point you, you jump in and you, under, you, you undercut him um, yeah. because, because you, you're so, you're so uh, basically well, firstly it's a good trade it appears and secondly it seems like you really want to get you'd rather get the trade than let it get to Sunny I suppose yeah I mean it was, it was good by him yeah yeah this was uh, interesting for sure and just well, just a note before you get into the detail of the trade maybe I don't know if you guys know this it's like an in-person thing that you just won't see online. I, if you look at every trade, I'm holding the card over 50% across the table, like for a reason, you know, like there's something about that physicality of having the trade approaching somebody where it's like the sense of committing to it makes it easier because it's in front of you. And so you'll see like every time I'm offering trades, like maybe I should even say this because it's like giving away a little bit of a, a tidbit of how I do it. But like, I'm purposely putting the card in front of them so that it's easier for them to make the commitment for the trade. Yeah, quite an interesting way to uh, psychologically make people feel like it, it is available for them. They can uh, yeah. can interact with that. Um, yeah, so I'll play this out here. This is quite a funny interaction. I, I, I mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I do like this this moment in the game. I don't think he'll take road. Are you taking this trade for both? For two sheep. No, it's a sheep and a wood. Yeah. Three to two is what he's offering. This is why I offered him. But I would rather no. you get but this trade than him. I would rather you get that trade than I'd him. I'd rather hit Josh Because in that these situation. three cards so are what you he does that not make, right? Deal. He makes only... And I can do future sheep. weed as well. Like, we can, can we keep the trades flowing. Two? And then what do you do with that? Do you settle road? Yeah. I have a spare weed How many cards well. do you have in hand? So, if he's willing to do that with you, I have to pour it for a wood. Does it empty your hand? No, I have to pour for a wood. Again, does it... If I did the two, would that empty your hand? I have the brick left, but I'm, I'm fine with you taking road. I'm, that's not my wood. I think it needs to go. All right, I don't know how to do. I'll do the. I'll do the two. I'll do the two. Shaz, I'll do the two. I'll do the two. Give me a wood too. Well, then we'll do the two for three. Yeah, that's what he's offering. Okay, let's just do it. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I try. Okay. <laughs> Again, some masterclass trading here those at this, cards are at this table. There you go. Yeah, that was that was tough. Um, that was probably the only time like I caved you could say but it was still a good deal for me right like the reason i got all these settles is primarily because i think i was getting the brick from Shao. so that situation two two brick and an ore for a wood sheep it's it's a no-brainer for me but it's also really good for a chassis as well yeah it was a really interesting spot right i felt like you know to cave in that spot it's you, you squeeze value until the last second uh, as far as you can, but in that position, it's still, yeah, it's an excellent trade to get your hands on, and you're not losing value there, I think. So it's, um, yeah, no, I, I, I really like that. And I, I thought, uh, just as Retired Hero and Chat mentioned, it's the kind of thing that you really could only do online is that two players actually agree to a trade, and you go, hold yeah. on, it's, no, maybe not. And you put your hand right in the middle. Like, Sonny could have just plucked them out of Shao's hands, and yeah. Could have been, yeah. could have been that almost. I think if I was Sunny, I would have ripped it. <laughs> you know, I'd just be like, nope, it's over. But um, yeah, I mean, it worked out. It's it's such an interesting dynamic for people that don't play over the board. Like there's so many of these little just in-person nuances that you got to get used to. Even, even for me, I mean, this is only my second Nats. Um, you know, I'm learning every time I show up to these tournaments. And, and you know, Sunny, I mean, he's he's actually more experienced in person than I am. So I think that's a there's always something to learn and improve on, which I love that. Yeah, I thought that that was uh, quite entertaining to to watch you phys <laughs> physically intercept a trade. I, I have never seen that happen before. Um, yeah, 
So just another another tip for how you can get it. Uh, Drew advocates for physical interceptions all the time. Uh, if you have to, you know, knock them over or anything, get the trade. Always win. <laughs> do what you got to do, man. <laughs> Don't, get Don't get kicked out. Don't get kicked out. Yeah. Um, all right. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I wrote in my notes here that I consider this a bit of a no-lose situation. Um, you know, you're originally trying to get a trade, which is good for you and... and uh, holding out until the point where someone else is willing to do it and then you still at the end of the day you still get the the trade that is good for you but you you've you've run down as far as you can down that road of making e making it even better right yeah yeah i mean sometimes as much as i'd love to be able to get three for one trades every day sometimes you just have to say like for the sake of compromise um and this is also just kind of a good rule of life too it's like Sometimes it's good just to keep the momentum going, right? Like, even though the, the three for two is still good, um, like, I also don't want them to feel like I'm always just trying to push them for everything they got. Because uh, that also can, can be a little bit of a negative effect on the table, too. So at that point, I was like, okay, I'll cave a little bit, keep the momentum going, and see where I can take it from there. Well, and, and, and even a more immediate um, downside is that Sonny would get that trade, which is also very good for him. Um, exactly, exactly. Yeah. With the... And, with the three down devs, it was like that. Let's just, all right, let's just figure this out, Shaz. Yeah, and the guy doesn't even yeah. make bricks. So those, yeah, whole whole number of ways that could have gone, gone wonky. Um, nice. Considering how how no, how close we know that he got, uh, yeah, shockingly so. Could have been the difference. Exactly. Cool, you, man. You physically, you, you physically stopped him from winning the game. <laughs> <laughs> all hindsight. I mean, that's yeah. the interesting part of this. But yeah. yeah, I think that had to be done. That's pretty funny. Yeah, so uh, quite quite a highlight for me. Um, moving forward, now this is a bit. This is necessarily a uh, an absolutely colossal moment, but uh, just about three minutes later, you do have a. I think you roll a seven here, and uh, you end up. Right, they flip the board here. Yeah, so you end up placing the robber on the six, and you and you rob from a Joshua who I think at this point has actually revealed uh, that he is holding a roll builder. And uh, and you end up breaking his settle. I think Sonny then follows up and does the exact same thing. Um, yep. Yeah. So how are you feeling in that spot? Obviously, he is. Uh, you mentioned that Josh already was in quite a good position. Um, was that what you were hoping to get out of it? Did you just want the cards in his hand? I don't know how you felt. He had he had good cards. I mean, right now, I mean, you didn't know this when you're watching the game, but obviously, I I had a down dev which was a VP. So I think right now I'm at what one, two, three, four. I'm at five. As soon as I pull that first VP, my path becomes clear and clear because then if I can pull a second VP, then I just city out with my road settle on the five. So I was actually feeling pretty good about the situation. Like if I'm not pulling VPs, I'm in a ton of trouble because my points are much more difficult after my two road settles. But um, yeah, I think just hitting Josh here, he has the road builder, which is almost a guaranteed point for him. I felt that made a lot of sense. And also I didn't want him to take the center of the board because I wanted Shao to like connect for road and extend that game. So it was just a bouncing move, a bounce steal, steal for me against Josh in that situation. Yeah, it was pretty funny. Josh uh, did mention, uh, as we were talking earlier, that his exact hand was like the settlement and then like an ore and an extra wheat. And he lost specifically the only wood, the only sheep, and then got yeah. completely forked out of, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's the way it goes. I mean, to be fair, I got solo blocked at three points, so I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> we oh, all no. got a little bit of uh, heat for sure. Definitely. Um, and it turns out actually worked. It, it, it potentially did work out pretty well for you. I mean, it, I'm not sure if actually it was a good thing or a bad thing to delay that settle because maybe he could have intercepted Shao earlier. It's one of those things that it's really hard to know now. Um, yeah. But yeah. yeah. Impactful regardless. It definitely mattered. Yeah, it did. And actually it gave us leverage in the conversation on, on Josh's turn, um, which I don't know if you're going to show that particular plow. But uh, it's very interesting, like the, the way all the events kind of played out right like where he ended up taking his road builder and for what reasons and uh, i'm kind of also i haven't really talked to josh yet i would definitely want to sit down with him and discuss the game but um i think there's a lot of interesting considerations in terms of how we played all these hands yeah so it might be this play the, here I, yeah this yeah. is the moment um yeah. so so right so um as as josh mentioned you, you because he had lost the wood and the sheep to each you and sunny uh, he was then actually effectively forced to trade the remaining cards out of his hand for the other two. And I think he actually gave you an ore here. Um, 
he did. I was I was yeah. actually kind of surprised about that. Maybe in hindsight, he should have given me the other card. Hmm. But um, I think he was just kind of committed to the game plan. They didn't think about the consequence of giving me an aura. But yeah. at the same time, I am behind here, right? Like I have one open settle and I'm definitely losing army. But it's, it's another example of, uh, you know, you don't actually end up having to use the weak port much. This is, you know, you get that yeah. ultra and, oh, another dev uh, that I don't need to yeah. port for, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Also, well, a little subtle thing too. I mean, there there's kind of this idea in, in sales and kind of like psychology about how do you how do you push somebody without or how do you kind of like influence somebody where you're nudging them but not pushing them and the amount of times that we got everyone to kind of start revealing their devs was actually kind of shocking and it was just because we applied a little bit of pressure to be like well what do you got what are you doing here like you're a threat um i hope like it was noticed like i didn't say anything about my devs anything but we got a ton of information from josh and sunny which I felt was a little bit of a mistake i felt like they were giving just too much to the board when they could probably could have held that closer to themselves and probably gotten a little bit more out of that situation. So it's a very subtle thing. Yeah, this is actually one of the moments I, I say for later, but yeah, there is a spot where Josh says, effectively, I have no VPs and immediately blood in the water. I mean, it's like everyone instantly knows <laughs> there's like, there's so many victory points out there. It's, it's crazy. It, I think it became something like that, like this three and eight or something, it, three and seven. Yeah, yeah it became just a, a pulling, pulling fast at that point yeah, <laughs> yeah. um so yeah in this spot i'll just play this out but this is this is josh actually getting do, giving the trades uh, getting getting two individual trades with you yourself and sunny and plowing the 10 2 uh which does cut longest road and uh maybe we can talk about the impact of that uh in a second yeah yeah, yeah let's play it out yeah well i i think i think it's right to, say you trade road, to josh, but getting the easy uh, points using is, that road building he claimed before thank you josh uh, that's still a good spot for him so this is actually a, uh, okay, so road does not go to anyone. Bye bye road. This is a big bye bye road. Uh, that was you saying that in the clip, I believe. You said bye bye road. Uh, road went bye bye. <laughs> no, yes. I said I just said that now, but yeah, I didn't say that in the clip. <laughs> this is interesting because I think Josh wasn't happy. Like I, I saw his interview, he wasn't happy that he he did this. I do think it's the right play, but. The way he approached it could have been better from the standpoint of he should have extracted more value burning the road builder right like maybe he gets two future cards from both of us and all of a sudden like he's got a little bit more compensation but i think cutting the road and not giving Shao that easy settle and making the fact that he needs a connect to me i i do think it's the right play for the board but he just should have extracted more value from both of us to make and that play happen he, he did mention his regret here was actually his primary regret was actually um making the plow and then not attempting to play for road um which yep. would have been open to him i mean you know by the end game there if he did have a role play open he, he ended up actually feeding shao world anyway um so he, he apparently yeah he told me he gave him three wood and told him to connect and, and that ended up happening yeah that i didn't understand this dynamic because they were freaking out about sunny taking road for the win i'm like how like he, he takes road like maybe he can go to eight points i felt that was a little bit premature to be honest with you i didn't think we had to like feed Shao everything. If anything, I wanted Shao to be using his own resources and not getting easy wood and brick. So I wasn't crazy about that. I'd rather Shao just port what his hand and not build cities or devs, but you know, that's just the way it played out. Yeah, and I think I think, you know, from Josh's perspective, that probably that play was the difference between him him having a winning window and not at all. Um where in the end game, you know, a settle in two rolls, that could have been the connect, that could have been the loop. Um that could have that could have actually brought home the win potentially. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, all in hindsight. I do think he could have he could have been more patient and, and cut Shao's road potentially and fight road like you said, but you know, in the heat of the moment, people don't realize like how much pressure there is in that room in that situation, right? Like we've been playing Catan for hours, days, and um I think we were all just like on some level exhausted too. So it's and then you're also factoring in, you know, it's being live streamed to thousands of people. It's like um it's not an easy situation to sit there and be chill about. Yep. And, uh, well, despite that cool as a cucumber, I think we, uh, we have a moment. So this mm -hmm. is right here. You actually get a one for one trade, which gives you a city. Yep. Uh, let me see. Yeah. So this is a trade with Shao. And I think actually at the moment where this happens, you can audibly hear Shao saying something along the lines of, oh, I didn't know that was going to be a city. I shouldn't have done that. 
Uh, yeah, he's like, oh, you're buying a dev? I'm like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would like a city, please. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I'll play that clip out real quick, and then cool. you, can, uh, you can fill us in. I can, I can do right. we for war, yeah. sure. Help you pop? Help. We got an ask. Fill city. Yeah. And exactly right after I say it, he got uh, what, that city down happening? on that eight four. That was I don't a know big what trade. I, yep. I am so confused. <laughs> we just have yes. Sunny there saying, "I am so confused." Uh, yeah. Just What's stressing, happy? just straight up stressing. Yeah. I'm not happy about that. Well, and these are the consequences. All these little trades, right? Like the I got the the wood for ore to help. So one of the ores was from the Josh trade when he plowed, and I believe the other ore was from the Sunny trade for the four for two. Uh, he, well, that that may have gone towards a dev. I Maybe. actually do not know the timing on that. Uh, I don't recall where I got the other ore. But like again, like these are it's a, such a subtle thing. If you can keep that momentum going, like you can keep your hand moving. So, yeah, yeah that was that was. Um, I was actually kind of shocked, but then again, also I put the card across the table. I think Shao just kind of it made it easy for him to say yes, um, especially under the assumption he thought I was buying a dev. Yeah, and then at this point you have you have two cities down. I think this, especially with a VP, um, you're you're not quite, I guess, in the end game, but you're very much approaching it. And you do have an open settle, which is a pretty textbook way of of finding that final point or or kind of uh, leave it, leaving a secure point for yourself open. Um, yeah, how do you feel now? You drop this city. It feels like the majority of what you need to do this game is already done. Yeah, yeah, this is, I'm feeling much better about the situation. Um, and it, there was a comment I made to Sonny because he was getting frustrated. I was like, you're acting like you're not about to play a knight. <laughs> because, like, if you're so, like, if he has a knight, he just flips it and life's good, right? But the fact that he was getting super fresh, I'm like, you must not have a knight. So that was interesting too. But yeah, I felt like pacing wise, I'm kind of sitting with the table nicely. I still have a little bit of tradeability. And, uh, you know, okay, I only have one down dev. But I think if I can get a couple rolls, I can keep the devs moving and hopefully get on the lucky side there. Yeah. So I was, I was, I was generally pretty happy about this situation. Yeah, it's a good spot to be in. And, and obviously, no one else knows about your VP. They, they might be able to guess. But um, you, have a, you have a really big turn coming up here. And okay. this is actually the turn that does put you into the end game. Uh, you, you've rolled a seven here. And I'm going to play this oh, clip yeah. out. Yeah, because this is this is quite interesting. People, you should make sure you listen to this. I'll, I'll turn up the sound for you a little bit. Um, let's uh, let's listen to. It. Seven. 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 That's brutal. Twelve. In a extremely brutal seven out for Drew, he had a, wow. the the rolls the rolls hit him that orbit huge. And that's the risk, right? When you're on so few numbers and put cities on them, you, it's it's feast or famine. And he, he got fed and he has to now discard down to six so, cards, unfortunately. We did have a question from Ari. This is not the quarterfinal. Uh, this is the national final. Um, so we had the semifinals card. before this. Each of these players did win their uh, respective games. Um, I can help you. And I, now I this is the final. For. <laughs> so the winner will join I don't think I'm uh, in a position Bo and Griffin. Uh, at worlds. I agree. Are you saying what you, are you saying what I think you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't have to be me. It does. It does. It it does. does. Action on a turn, but right. So I'm gonna actionable we, as we you would be with saying the words. twelve cards. <laughs> right. So I'm gonna buy a dev. His odds of taking my or were huge. And I do like this. Settle. Yeah, I do like the strategy by to get yeah. all right absolutely massive there's about five big things that happen there i think uh, pretty crazy yeah. Yeah, yeah starting with the seven which yeah and you said really off. sucked because that was 12 cards in my hand so i had to go down to six and um so i i had a really good turn you know i had to throw away six cards but what i kept i kept the settle in hand then i kept the sheep and a wheat the idea is if i can steal an ore then I have a development card. I have a perfect hand, right? Development card settle. So um, what was interesting, one of the rules of this tournament was that you can extort, but somebody can self-extort to the person robbing, which is what Shadies did. So 
when I put it onto the six, knowing that Shady's had ore in his hand, I was really considering robbing him. And he's like, well, I have what you want. Or like, I'll, I don't remember exactly what he said. Maybe you can remember his line. Yeah, he said, he said something along the lines of, uh, I know what you're looking for. I think I can help you yeah. out here. I don't yeah. think I'm in a position to be getting robbed from. And he just hear you saying very clearly, are you saying what I think you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So uh, more or less, we agreed to an extortion deal right there uh, without actually extorting. So I robbed Shazzy. I flipped the wood that I stole from him back to Shady's for the ore. Pull, I don't know. Do you want me to say what I pulled? Everyone knows at this point. Yeah, you got it. Um, I pull a VP and then I drop a settle. So that was a two point play off of a horrible seven. But again, these are these moments like you just got to be glued in and looking for opportunities, which was, I think a lot of people miss that little subtle extortion there. Yeah, I didn't notice it during the game, actually, or something that you, you pointed out afterwards, which was, uh, yeah, it's pretty interesting that that was that went very much under the radar. Uh, the fact that Josh actually agreed to give you something there and he, he knew what you were looking for. Um, yeah. It made so, sense because I think he had two ore in his hand anyway. So right. um, it was a good deal for both of us. Now, putting the VP was absolutely clutch there. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. Just yeah, and at this point, I'm at, I'm at eight points. I'm like, oh, my God. I, the path, so, so as soon as you pull that second VP, the path is there. Right, because then I can city city, so I'm feeling it now. I'm feeling it for sure. Yeah, so you have, you now have actually entered the end game, and um, I think I, I remember you saying that you weren't especially nervous at uh, kind of uh, during most of the game, and and uh, that you didn't really feel too affected by that. But at this point, you are looking at an end game for mm -hmm. becoming the U.S. national champion. I mean, what was actually going through your head at that point? Well, I did it in this hand with no cards. So there there was that, right? It's like, oh, damn, okay, I need my rolls, which we are playing Feast or Famine. But the path was there. Like, I was getting excited. I really wanted to make sure that we were balancing the board. I wanted to make sure that the threats were as apparent as they could be. So at this point, it's just like bouncing my way to the end game to make sure that nobody's sneaking away with it. And everyone has like more or less transparency to what's going on. Of course, like I wasn't going to be fully transparent about my devs. But um, I think if I can kind of get somebody to crack a little bit more about what they have, uh, that information is just power for the table. So I think it was just staying steady, right? Like I think in these situations when the pressure's on, you got to stay cool, calm, and collected. Uh, if not, like you're going to make a lot of suboptimal decisions. And it, it might not even be just like with your cards, but also socially, right? Like you don't want to get somebody upset in the end game where they're they're looking at you more, they're blocking you more. So I was just, I, there was a couple of times actually where I had to remind myself like, take a moment, breathe you know, present to the moment kind of thing, just to kind of keep my, my nerves there. Yeah. I'm not surprised. Uh, it looked pretty intense and I wasn't even there. Um, <laughs> you were there in spirit for sure. I was there in spirit. Felt good. Um, yeah, this is, this is, uh, maybe not a huge strategic moment, but at the same time, this is the kind of stuff that really does weigh into the end game. This is actually, uh, a funny clip where shades well i think sunny actually says shao's on eight drew's on eight uh and and then shades or josh says something to the effect of is drew on eight and and you just shake your head in silence <laughs> I'm just gonna play that. It's, <laughs> it's a funny clip um okay yeah so, five, six, seven, eight. so, so what does he need drew's at eight Zhao's drew's at eight Zhao's at eight drew's at eight what yeah and that was a moment where you know they don't know about the dev which is that's kind of what i guess what you want to communicate anyway uh which is that there's no reason for you to think that i'm on eight here but uh yeah it's so close there i mean by the by the end it's it was really hard to know as a spectator what you actually had in hand um was it was it just your priority to to try and keep that information from getting out as, as much as possible of course of course i don't want them to know i have two vps because then the path becomes very clear and there was a couple times where I bluffed the night. They were trying to get me to play night uh, on Sunny when he was rolling really well. And I was like, I have no cards. I have no reason to play my night. It's like both of the six rolls are really bad for me either way. So I'd rather have a defensive resource than not. And I'm not getting army. So it's like, what's the point? So I really try to keep that under wraps as much as I could. But at a certain point, you know, once I get blocked, it uh, becomes pretty apparent. I've got either, I think a lot of people put me on mono, which makes sense if I'm denying two VPs. I don't know what's actually worse, really, because it's not like, what can I do with the mono? Maybe I can city and pop a few times. But uh, that last point would be very difficult with the mono, I think. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it, I remember while watching it, just thinking, it, you know, Drew hasn't got much potential to mono wheat yet, but the all mono could be pretty massive, potentially double yeah. city or something. Yeah, if I can grab like five or six or and have a bunch of wheat and sheep in hand, I mean that that could be an amazing play. So yeah, but two cities would would still not be enough if you're only on seven there. So exactly, um, yeah. and then you need an extra point. So the VP was was absolutely huge, um, putting putting locking you now on eight points and. Um, yeah, understandable that you don't want to reveal that. I think that's somewhere where it got a little bit difficult in the end game for, for Josh. Actually, we discussed that. He did give away that information. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're skipping forward to a point here where uh, you actually straight up City for nine points. I'll just mm -hmm. play this out as you place this down. And this is this ends up being a City on the five. We'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. Uh, here we go. It, yeah, okay. Unless... <laughs> I'm gonna go for a city here. Okay. So he's either taking the city for the tenth point or pulling for the tenth point. Plop. Drew in a great position now. In a, yeah, we just heard Andrew saying Drew in a great position here. I mean, uh, it looks like nine points for all intents and purposes. Uh, yeah, where are you? Where Where is your head at here? Are you going to nine <laughs> national championships? I'm at nine. I'm not. Uh, I don't believe I'm blocked. No, it's like it's on the six. I have monster rolls. And um, I believe it was correct for me to put it onto the five there, honestly, because the eight's still a good roll, but I'm expecting Sonny to play a knight next turn and they're going to put me on nine. So it's like, they're going to block the eight most likely. So I need that five to be juiced, which I feel like a lot of people just throw on the eight without thinking about the consequence of that. So yeah, I mean, I'm at nine points in this setup. I'm absolutely thrilled. Are you kidding me? Yeah, and uh, and obviously important here is now after that city, two eights or two fives are both the win, uh, are both another city. Yeah, yeah, as long as they're open. Yeah, exactly. So I guess that is a point about, uh, you know, there's no real reason to city the eight when, when it is open, two eights is the win anyway. Um, yeah. Yeah, yep. Yeah, so uh, putting it on the five there was obviously works around the, the inevitable block and yeah, it gives you more options, which yeah, now two fives is also winning, which is pretty spooky. Yeah, I didn't I didn't have a lot of fives either this game. No. Um, and I didn't have any in the end game, which would have been amazing, but it is what it is. There was, there was the, the case of the five that disappeared. Um, <laughs> oh. Yeah, That's, we don't talk about that. We don't talk about that. But there was also... Uh, I didn't, I didn't get a screen cap of that because it wasn't so much a moment uh, on video. It's just kind of a thing that happened in game. But there was a turn, I think, right around this point where you you rolled a seven. Oh, no, sorry. You played. You actually played the knight out. This was about in the mid game. Yeah. You played the <laughs> we knight talk, out. We don't talk about that point either, Dev. <laughs> Indeed. You played the knight out and you blocked somewhere. Yeah. You made a steal and you were super happy and you played your turn and you just passed and uh, did not roll the dice. I think that was... Uh, that was something that not many people picked up on when we were watching it live. Yeah, it's hard to know what's the EV or negative EV of that play, right? Because then nobody gets cards. So it's not as, it's not great, obviously, for me. Like I could have maybe cashed in, but also it's not that bad. No, it doesn't blunder heavily for mo for you more than anyone else, really. It's just, uh, it's just kind of a funny thing. It is a bit of a nothing burger. It's just a weird thing to see happen in a, in a game like that. Um, yeah. I think the only the only difference is like the opportunity cost. If you roll on your turn, obviously you can spend it, but yeah, uh, yeah, just a, yeah. just a highlight is not 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 really a criticism of any sort. Just a funny moment. <laughs> yeah, when you're, it was just we're just caught in the moment, totally forgot. That's all it is, nothing more. Yeah, and uh, yeah. So moving on from that, we are. This is actually now taking us into the ending sequence. Uh, which is uh, pretty pretty hot and heavy. I, I think this is one of the this is a great end sequence for Catan. Really, the epitome of, of how close it can get, and, and really the difference <laughs> yeah. it comes down to. That was crazy. Yep. So uh, we have here uh, Sonny playing an absolutely massive turn, um, and I'll start off. This is a this is about a forty five second clip. Um, and I, I'm sorry, you won't be able to hear much of it, but the context is, is that this is actually, um, Sonny learns from Shades that there aren't any knights, that, that, that Shades is holding multiple knights, that he's admitted this, he's not holding VPs, and, and Sonny himself has the potential to take roads here. So um, we're just going to play this clip out because it, it actually is uh, an opportunity for Sonny to win on this very turn.
We lost our banker. Because um, <laughs> I've got to take the yeah. the brick and then something else. Someone bank or should we just? Oh, okay, 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 okay. Thank you. Where's the banker? Are we in a brick? Yeah. That's four. Oh, yep, four roads. Do you agree? Yep. So you're claiming yep. both. Yep. Uh -huh. yep. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, man. I'll, I'll watch. <laughs> I mean, you're going to nine, so. I know. I mean, just, if I pulled the VP, that was a win. Also, probably been very happy. the game alive for Drew. Me too. So this, this game is Thanks, so. coming down to the wire. Your claim is you have zero VPs. No. He just he just wanted to throw that to the mix. But then why else? We know you have two. This road for now. So the reason I the reason I, I, I really am sorry I did not want to do the that. The reason I think. All right, so uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So we actually see Sonny, uh, who would have won if he had a VP in hand, and then he pulls another dev, which also yeah. would have won if it were a VP. Yeah, huge, huge. Um, it's it's tough, right? It's like there are these situations where I think it's a forced move because I think Zhao just has the win if we don't do it. It's just one of those situations, right? It's kind of like a little similar to the 10 2 situation where it's like we kind of have to do it to keep the game going. Um, just unfortunate for Sonny that he's he knows he's kind of losing road, but like if he wants to have a shot, he's got to take road away from Shao. Yeah, and and seeing that he uh all he needed this whole game, Sonny, was one VP, and I think he, he had a couple of chances to maybe win, but. For sure. Yeah, but it's it's the butterfly effect of things too, right? Like obviously him pulling monos or yops, robot, like you know, if I had a mono earlier, it could have changed the entire trajectory of my game too. So it's it's, it's hard to calculate. Thing. It's true, true, yeah. Um, yeah, no, so just uh incredibly close here, and then this takes uh, this brings us actually to the final sequence, which is uh which starts with Shao's turn. Um, yeah, lighter. which yeah. man, just crazy. So uh, we know that by taking road, he will go. He will go back up to nine with a with a down VP, and and then he pulls for the win. And we'll watch that happen here. That sheep actually was a major pull. Is it Jao can pull one victory point? I might have oh. here. He does have a city. Good luck. Good luck. Got it. Take road. Have the win. Take a look back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's not win. It is not win. Good luck, Drew. Well, yeah. I think I just held my breath the whole time during that sequence. Yeah, and we, we hear actually Sonny asking the entire time, which must have been pretty stressful. He's saying, do you have it? Do, do you win? Have you, <laughs> have you won now? Yeah, I mean, yeah. It was that close. And, and actually, what we now know is that that dev that uh, Shao pulled was exactly one away from being the victory point he needed to win. It's it's really that close, yeah. It's which to me is kind of a hallmark of a, like a really good Catan game. It's like everyone was you know right there and it could have gone either way. It really really could have. Yeah, and even here, you know, Sunny Sunny calls good luck, uh, but it's still not clear whether you are going to be able to win on your so, turn. I think an eight might be winning. So there is there is one little quick consideration for Shao to be able to make that play. He had to steal a sheep, so he ended up stealing from Sunny that turn, and he was saying that I needed to seven out. That was like what he needed from me. So you know, he plays an eye, hits the four, steals from Sunny. I actually think that was a little bit of a mistake from him because he thought I had a dev no matter when. That's not true. I had six wood and two sheep. So the only way, like, if he steals a sheep, okay, fine. He hits the one out of four. But if he takes a wood, he breaks my dev. So I think, I don't know if that was just mistracking or what the case is, but I did not have a guaranteed dev. I did not. Yeah. But Okay. So then he makes that play, he almost wins, and then obviously it's on my turn here. And they pass it to you, and I'll, I'll let this play out. Joe did lose. <laughs> we can, we can hear him out there. <laughs> They're like, come on, no seven. Six. Six? Nice white dudes. GG. Here's the ball for it. He doesn't have city, right? No. Yeah. His, his odds are good. 
How many is that? That's one? a dab. He one. is pulling for the win. Well done, sir. And he did it. Drew did Let's go. it. Let's go. Wow. Congrats, man. What a finish. Damn. There it is. There it is. There it is. Crazy. Oh, man. Just a, an emotional, like, energy dump after I flip those cards over. Oh. <laughs> yes, that's a, that's a cool little moment. Yeah, yeah. Huge. Um, <laughs> the banker is also here, very happy. Yeah, she's like, I gotta go home. <laughs> yeah, she's just finally yeah. done. Yeah, yeah it, it was kind of a weird sequence because I needed a roll, didn't get it. Um, and you see what I do is I, I take my entire stack, I tap it a couple times. I'm like, this is it. Like that that's essentially what's going through my head is like I either pull it or I don't because I think I'm losing next turn practically no matter what. So um you'll see me. I just put a card down. That's the one sheep. I already have the dev ready, like early on. Um, pass over to the banker. And um this was the only time that I felt the nerves, like my adrenaline started to like kick in here because I'm like, this is it. This is I got one shot. Like I've played well, but if I miss, I miss. So I bring the dev over, look up, and it just says victory point. <laughs> at that point like i just get a surge grab the devs and then just drop it and um it's hard to describe that feeling you know it's it's uh it's one thing if you're pulling on online right because you just press the button and then it just happens uh but to be able to go through that sequence and like flip it man that was that was something that was electric yeah i, I can't even imagine what that's like i mean pulling for the win in a in a huge final the national final the biggest one yeah, yeah what a well, that must be a a, a bucket of nerves and then and then it is actually the victory point and i think sun sees it first and he says well done i think so but yeah. i also think you didn't see it on my face but I, my face must have given it away too because like you know i must have been like whoa but uh it's just one of those things man it comes down to who's pulling that final vp and like i said i think that's a hallmark of a really good game it's like everyone's in it and it's coming down to the development cards and could have gone many different ways on that final orbit really could have yeah, definitely. And, and we see that basically, uh, I mean, yeah, you were one of three people who could have won that orbit and it was just crazy close. Uh, yeah, Sonny, Sonny needing, Sonny, Sonny having two potential chances to have won with, with just the one VP and did not get it and Shao missing the VP and then you getting specifically the VP that both of them were looking for. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, and, and also too, it's, it's kind of funky because Josh had down devs. You don't know, like, he could win it. Sonny could pull two VPs there with his mono. It's... I really feel like anybody could have won that in this final orbit. It definitely so, felt that way. And the only thing was Josh actually did communicate. He, he didn't have VPs, which obviously, which helped with the hunt a little bit. Yeah. And he, he, he made himself come off very honest, obviously getting frustrated with the dishonesty. So I actually trusted him there, but some players might not play it that way. You know, they might be dishonest in the very final end, end of the game to kind of push people off the scent. I think you might have to be, to be honest. I mean, if you were on nine there with an open settle, it's all night. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, yeah. man, I, I'm super grateful to everyone at the table. Like, massive respect to to Shao and Sonny and, and Josh. Um, I really felt we had a great game. I think we did what we needed to do to keep the game going. And, yeah, I'm just um, obviously relieved and happy it's me. But at the same time, I would have been ecstatic if it was anyone else at that table. And, uh Ultimately, like I went into that tournament, I was looking to have a good time. I had a blast, and I think to me, uh, winning it was definitely the cherry on top. But I would have been happy either way. Yeah, I mean, it was it was uh, it was great to watch, and yeah, just all around a really exciting event, I think, and uh, obviously historic, not just for you, but also for for the Catan space. This is now you know three years in a row. Uh, if you count bowlers, it's three years in a row that we've had. You know, some of our real Catan celebrities bringing it home, some of the most uh, renowned players online. It's been Bull and Griffin and then you. Uh, yeah, uh, just uh, incredibly excited that you managed to, to, to get it all together and to, to pull that massive win out. I appreciate that, man. And it's nice to see that, you know, there's always been this divide between Catan being a skill game or a luck game. You know, these top players that have been kind of in the scene, theory crafting, working on what they do, it's showing that there is a skill element to this game. And uh, it's I think it's becoming more and more transparent as we're we're growing this game and we're kind of developing it. So um, yeah, i'm I'm happy to kind of stand on the shoulders of giants and keep keep growing the game with you guys. And 
yeah, it's exciting. I, I hope we kind of keep this trend of the Discord players crushing it because we're, we're doing pretty well. Yeah, 100%. And uh, we're going to have to look forward to, to Worlds in just, uh, just about eight months, I think, seven months for that. It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. And also, kudos yeah. to you, Dad. I mean, you you ran an awesome stream, too. Like, I like the fact that this is becoming a little bit of a yearly tradition, too. I love it. It's uh, it's amazing fun. And uh, yeah, no, it's always it's always uh, inspiring to try and to try and beat what Katan is doing themselves and try and try and put on a real good event for people. So, yeah, it's always my pleasure to be involved. Uh, someone someone's asking. OK, that's, that's fine. Um, so before we before we end off here, Drew. Yep. I uh, I'm curious, you know, you, you've you've now graduated the Nationals course and you uh, you have a, an appointment in about seven months to go to Germany. Um, but, you know, from now until then and, and, and afterwards, what what's in the books for Dandy Drew? What have you got planned? What's coming up? Man, uh, obviously, this is going to become like a nice little part of the channel as far as the content over the coming months. I think I'm going to stay course. I think I'm just going to stay course. You know, we've, I feel like I'm, I'm in a place where I'm enjoying doing the YouTube side and there, there's a whole emotional capacity part of that where it's like, you know, you've got to manage your, your own self. So you're, you're bringing the right person to the table so you can enjoy the process. But, um, I've got some things in the pipeline. I, I think we're going to run another TSI pretty quickly. You know, maybe some talks about, uh, little, little things maybe with CPI. We'll see. We'll see. Don't know. Maybe. But um, I'm just going to keep running the course. I think as far as ready, ready for Worlds, I, I think just my attitude is going to be the biggest factor there. I've got all the skill that I need to win it, but um, making sure I'm showing up, having a good time, and bringing that energy to the table is going to be key. Yeah, well, I'm excited to see it. I'll be there myself. Um, That's and, awesome, uh, man. I'm looking yeah. forward to uh, giving you a hug and grabbing a beer. And Yes, indeed. We will have a good time, man. Meet. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm hyped to meet everyone there. It's going to be a great time. But uh, for now, I think we've kind of we've kind of gone through everything that we're hoping to get through today. That's it, man. Awesome, awesome job. Only got respect for what you're doing, Dav. And uh, I know the community is very lucky to have somebody like you. So kudos to you as well. And people forget this is this is not just about U.S. Nationals and these interviews, but this is also one of Dav's anniversaries. He's been in the scene for three years and. I'm very uh, grateful that maybe I was one of the first people to say, "Hey, who is this yeah. guy?" And yes, indeed. Took you took you a while to make the discords, though. I felt like you stayed in CU for a good like six to eight months, and I was like, "Come on, Dav, come on over." Uh, I was stubborn. I <laughs> like the ultra matches. <laughs> the the water's warm. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Beautiful transition, man. And like I said, the community is very lucky to have somebody like you here. Well, obviously the feeling's mutual, and uh, look look at where we are now. We're quite quite the journey we travelled, <laughs> but yeah, just uh, excited to see what comes next, and uh, we'll both be involved in that. So that's awesome, about dude. it. I really appreciate it. Thanks for everyone showing up, and hopefully you got some cool little insights from that. Yeah, I think uh, there were definitely some points in that that I was I was really interested to hear about, and. Yeah, overall, thank you so much, Drew, for taking the time and, and giving us uh, giving us your thoughts on this, this epic win, the whole experience. Uh, yeah, I hope you have a great weekend and uh, looking forward to, to seeing what you get up to soon. Appreciate it, guys. Have a wonderful rest of your day, okay? Peace! Peace.